All right. Well, good morning, everyone. This is my mic. the mic's on, right? Yeah. Okay. We're good to go. So, um, here's a quick question: How many of you guys are uh, fans of birthdays? No. Wow. No one likes their birthday. Yeah. All, all the kids. All the kids are like birthday. Here come gifts. Um, personally, for me, uh, I always loved my birthday growing up because so like not to brag, but I was always like the cool kid on my birthday. Um, right. So like, cause my mom was just, so to put it into perspective, um, I was, I, I was pretty much raised in a private school for the most part. I know huge shocker. Um, I ended up as a preacher and I like grew up in learning about the Bible and going over the same Bible stories thousands of times in, in school and stuff. Uh, so like my mom worked at the school, like everybody knew my mom, my mom was well liked, like all the kids liked my mom, uh, and so like, you know, I was real popular as a fourth grader, you know, like, like if, if you could be on varsity football in fourth grade, it would have been me, um, starting quarterback as a fourth grader, not really, but you get the point, um, so my birthday's uh, my mom would, like, bring in cake for, like, my class alone and, like, Chick-fil-A, right? So, like, obviously, I was Mr. Popular because instead of eating, like, turkey and cheese sandwiches, all the kids got to eat Chick-fil-A and, like, cookie cake because I was a huge fan of cookie cake. And uh, that's just the way that I was kind of, like, celebrated for my birthday. Uh, obviously, as a kid, you also get, like, gifts. You get toys. Like, everybody celebrates you, like, all this really cool stuff happens uh, for your birthday. Nowadays, I mostly get cards, um, you know, and, like, people hang out with me. Maybe we go to, like, a restaurant. Like, that's, that's kind of what happens nowadays. Like, for adults, birthdays, they just go way downhill, like, for the most part. You don't get the newest Lego set. It's kind of unfortunate. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. Uh, so... The same thing happens with pretty much anything where you kind of get a gift, right? Um, so if you think like Christmas, uh, ladies, hopefully anniversaries, right? Hopefully, sometimes. Sometimes you're like, you know, we didn't argue and that's a gift in itself. Um, so like there are different uh, gifts and different events for why we receive gifts. Um, here's what I noticed as I became an adult. Um, one of the reasons that it was, like, kind of cool to get the gifts is that I didn't have to, like, buy it for myself. Any of you guys, are any of you guys, like, that kind, of, that kind of person? Like, this past Christmas, I asked for, like, new bath towels. Like, I wanted towels for Christmas. And that's when you know you've hit a new level of adulthood. Uh, when you're asking for, like, totally normal, non-cool things because you really just don't want to buy it for yourself. Um, that's when you kind of feel like, you're, at a, you're like, I'm an adult now. Somebody else bought me this tool that I can now use to build stuff, and I didn't have to spend $200 on myself to get it. Um, but there's like a certain like entitlement that comes to like buying things, right? You're like, like, I worked for this money. I made this money. I bought this thing. I earned it. So because I always talk about dessert, um, apparently... So I, I talk about dessert a lot, if you, if you don't know that. Um, so, yes, I can always go to the Rustic Garden, and yes, I can always buy a dessert or two sometimes, not all the time, as it was clearly thrown out over this weekend. Somebody was like, you bought two desserts the other day, and I was like, okay, like, let's, let's back off a little bit. Um, so when I go and I buy my dessert, it gets brought to me, and I kind of expect it to be brought to me, right? Like, I earn the money. I paid for my dessert. You bring me my dessert. Now, here's a different thing. Here's a totally different story. So my birthday is, like, right around the corner, okay? So, like, hint, hint, uh, roughly a month from the 20th of this month, uh, I... 
I've lost track of the days, the snow day. Today's the 16th. So a month and four days from now uh, may or may not be my birthday. So while today, yes, I could go to the Rustic Garden and buy, um, you know, say like Butterfinger Pie, assuming that they are having it. I don't know. Um, no, they're not. Dang it. I'm going to have to boycott now. Um, so while I could go and buy my dessert for my birthday, I mean, it is on a Sunday this year. So if I showed up and there just like happened to be Butterfinger Pie, that is what we call a gift and one that is happily received. Any dessert is happily received on February 20th. That's all I'm saying. Uh, this is not this is not to guilt you into it. I'm just saying. If it is freely given, it is freely given. And so today, uh, this actually does tie into the sermon, just for the record. I'm not only ranting about desserts because I'm hungry. Um, that is true. It is Garrett's birthday that day to bring extra, right? <laughs> so this does tie in. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Uh, so Romans chapter 4, uh, Paul continues his talk about justification, uh, salvation, how we are seen as righteous in the eyes of God. And what Paul is going to clearly lay out is that your justification, the way that we are seen as righteous, it is a gift freely given to us not because we have earned it, not because we have worked for it, not because we have paid for it, not because we have done anything in order to be entitled to it, but simply because God in his goodness decided to give it to us freely. So if justification and salvation is cake, I do not pay for my cake, and so I am not entitled to cake. But if cake is freely given to me, say for a birthday, um, I can eat said cake and it comes from the goodness of somebody else who decided to bake it, do all the work, and then bring it to me. And so uh, let's, just, let's just think of salvation and justification in terms of dessert, okay, just for a second here. Um, what we are going to see is that when we choose by faith to accept justification, it is freely given to us. It is not earned by us, right? So if this is cake, somebody decided to bring it to you, it is not something that you went out and bought and said, now I'm going to eat it because I've earned it. So that's kind of the distinction that we're making here. So uh, the way that Paul lines this up is that he, he talks first about Abraham. So we are going to be uh, in verse 13. Uh, I'm going to summarize what happens before verse 13. So he starts his case by talking about Abraham. So he talks about Abraham and how Abraham was justified by his faith. So it was not the works that he did. It was not him uh, going through circumcision. It was not him doing all of these things. It was the faith that he had in what God had promised him that justified him. And so uh, he goes on to even say that Abraham was believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. And right there, he quotes from the Old Testament where that's what Genesis lays out for us is that it was through his belief in God that he was credited for righteousness. That is what the credit was. It was not the circumcision. It was not all of the things that he did. It was not the way he followed the law. That was not what was credited to, credited to him as righteousness. And he moves on uh, to even King David. So Paul has established this with Abraham. Now he is establishing this with David. 
And so he talks about how David reports that it blessed are those whose lawless acts are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the person the Lord will never charge with sin. So this is a blessing. It is a gift. And so Paul here is saying even David recognized that people are credited righteous because of what God chooses to do. So it is not because David was flawless. It's not because he easily followed the law. It's not because he was perfect that he was credited as righteous. He was seen as sinless because God freely justified him by grace. And so, like I had mentioned before, Paul then moves on to talking about Abraham and the circumcision that he went through, and he establishes that Abraham was justified before the circumcision. And so, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, the circumcision was uh, sort of the initiation into being an Israelite. So, with babies that took place uh, on day eight. So, they were born, then eight days later they were circumcised, and now they are considered an Israelite. And so, that is sort of what takes place, but Paul clarifies that Abraham is made righteous before that part. And so now we can pick up on verse 13, and it says this. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would inherit the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. If those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made empty and the promise nullified because the law produces wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. So let me pause right here and kind of break that down. So what Paul is saying here is that the law nullifies faith because the law comes through, and because of the law, we now know sin. That was established last week. We talked about that. So through, this, through the law comes knowledge of sin. And when that happens, once you break the law, you are now under God's wrath. Right? So let's not think of wrath as in, like, God's waiting for you to, you know, make a mistake, and then he's going to strike you dead, like, right then and there. That's not, like, what this is talking about. What this is talking about is that the punishment for sin is ultimately death and destruction. And so what Paul is saying is that through the law, now we have death and destruction. Right? So we're all on the same page. And he says that where there is no law, there is no transgression. So let's, let's think about this in terms of America. Um, when I completely butchered the roads out here uh, last week, but we, we all ended up on the same playing field that it was mostly about the speed limit, not about the street signs that tell me what road I'm on. Um, if there is no sign there and no sign anywhere along that road, how are you supposed to know what the speed limit is? And I mean, now, now we live with like Apple Maps and stuff like that, where it's like, now you know you're going too fast, and so that's a crying shame. Technology can sometimes be the worst. Um, but if you don't have anything indicating that something is illegal, how are you supposed to know? By faith. <laughs> sure, but you are not, you're most likely not going to be punished for breaking the law that you don't know exists. I mean, sometimes you are, but for the most part, maybe not. Um, there, that's why there are signs posted, no trespassing. That's why there are signs posted, no soliciting. It's so that you know what is wrong, and you know what is right, and you know what you can do and what you can't do. And so now that we know what we can't do, if you choose to do it anyway, you are now subject to the judgment of the United States government, right? Right? So, like, most people are aware there's a law that says you can't kill people. So if you go and you kill someone, you can go to prison for that. Like, you can get in legal trouble for killing someone because there's a law that says don't do it, right? So, like, what Paul is kind of saying here is that 
We now have the law, and those who are under the law are now under condemnation. But picking up uh, verse 16, it says this. This is why the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace to guarantee it to all the descendants. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of Abraham's faith. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our father in God's sight, in whom Abraham believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that do not exist. He believed, hoping against hope, so that he became the father of many nations according to what had been spoken. So will your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body to be already dead since he was about a hundred years old and also the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver in unbelief at God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because he was fully convinced that what God had promised, he was also able to do. Therefore, it was credited to him for righteousness. Now it was credited to him, uh, not what was not written for Abraham alone, but also for us. It will be credited to, credited to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So there's a lot right there. And it all stems down to this. Just as Abraham was justified by his faith, we too can be justified by our faith. So just as it was credited to Abraham as righteousness, not because of the circumcision that he went through, not because, and we're going to, this might be off-putting to some people, not because he was even willing to sacrifice Isaac later, That was not what made him righteous in God's sight. It was not his willingness to follow through with that. What made him righteous was that God promised something, and Abraham chose to believe that promise despite all of the things that were against him. So despite the fact that he was older and not really at the the peak of childbearing, and despite the fact that Sarah was not at the peak of childbearing, they were still able to conceive because Abraham believed that what God promised, God was also able to do. So Abraham's not even justified by God producing the child. So it's not like there's this huge fulfillment that has to take place for him to be initially justified by God. It takes place at the faith and belief that God is going to follow through on what he says. And so Paul's final statement is that for us, we are justified by belief that God promised to save us through the sacrifice of his son, and he has followed through, and it is our belief in him promising it and him following through that we are justified. So it is not about how much good we do. It is not about how hard we work. It is not about whether or not we choose to follow the government's laws. It is not about whether or not we follow the Old Testament laws. That is not what makes us righteous in the sight of God. What makes us righteous in the sight of God is our belief and our faith in Jesus Christ who came to die on the earth in order that we may be justified. Now, you know that that word justified is a pretty important word if that's the one word that Paul chooses to end on. That is what Paul is focusing on from Romans chapter 3 to Romans chapter 4. And again, uh, as we stated last, uh, last week, Paul is kind of 
highly talking to the Jewish Christians here. And what he's trying to establish is that everybody is considered a son of Abraham. We are all heirs and descendants of him through our faith. And so we can be justified through our faith in Christ. And so the, the, these passages are difficult for us to like have these key takeaways, right? Like um, a lot of people, they, they like to like walk away from a sermon, like what do I do now that I've learned? Like what does this Bible passage say that I need to do? Some passages are meant to give hope. Like, as we wrap up this sermon, this sermon is a message of hope. It is not, if there's anything that's been established, it is not about everything that you do. It is about God's sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And so, it is a message of hope that is given to all people of all nations, of all times. And so, if you are the, the kind of person who's like, I have to have something to do as I walk away, uh, tell people the good news. There you go. You want something to do? Tell people that it is not about all the things that they do well. It's not about what they do right. It is about who their faith is in. Now, if this is not a decision that you've made, if uh, the decision to place your faith in Christ is not one that has been personally made, uh, there you go, there's something you can do. If you want to walk away from the sermon with some kind of thing to, to do, and that is not the first step that has been taken, there's your first step. That Jesus Christ came to die for your sins, not because you earned it, not because uh, you worked so hard, but because God was willing to do it for you. So, if justification and salvation is cake, we did not earn it. We did not go out and buy it for ourselves, and we are not entitled to it. God chose to, we're going to stick with the analogy, God chose to put the ingredients together, to place it in the oven, to bake it, and to bring it for mankind out of the goodness of who he is, not out of what we did to earn it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us. God, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your promises that you always deliver. God, I thank you that you promise justification through your Son. God, that we may be seen as righteous, not based on our own good deeds, not based on what we do, how much of the Old Testament we follow, but God, simply because of our belief and our faith in your Son. God, I thank you that your Son came to die so that we can be justified in your sight. God, I pray that if anybody has not made that decision to place their faith in you, God, that you would just work on their heart and, and show them that they can be reunited with you not by anything that they do, but by faith in who your son is and what he came to do for them. God, I pray that this is a message of hope and one of peace that we can spread with those who are around us. God, that as we leave from here, we can be a witness to what you have done to those around us. God, we thank you for your son and his sacrifice on the cross. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Now, uh, I am going to be down front if anybody would like to make any decisions or would like uh, prayer for anything.
uh, now would be the time to do so as uh, Mike and Dave come up to lead us in one final song. <laughs> 